Over the last couple of weeks, what we've been doing is we've been diving down with practical tips, practical things, practical application of what it means to be in relationships, healthy relationships, what makes healthy relationships, what makes um, relationships, uh, what we like to say is toxic. What I love about the Word of God is that you can do that and come up with steps to who God created us to be and how he's created us to live. But at the same time, you can also take a 30 or 40 or 50,000 foot look at scripture and it be just as powerful. What God did last night in our Saturday night service was absolutely incredible. And he's gonna do something. He's gonna speak to us this morning the same way. When you look at the word of God, sometimes what you see is people maybe like you and I living life and living out this journey we call life. And then in ways and in situations, um, they miss God. They miss him. uh, Scripture tells us that God is all around us. God is with us every day. One of the last comments he makes to the disciples says, you will do greater things than even I. He says, and remember, lo, I will be with you always, always. And so we have this promise that Jesus is with us in every situation, although it may not look like it, it may not feel like it. And when you take a look at the Gospels, four Gospels, four accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each writer wants you to know something somewhat similar, but each one of the books have a distinct theme that they write from. I want to look at that theme because maybe in some ways in our life, even though Jesus says he's with us, he can be invisible to us. That in some ways he can be, did I, I didn't, who, who's, did, did I miss it? So we take a look at the Gospel of John, and John starts out with this big gigantic theme And he wants us to know how God holds everything together. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Without him, everything, he holds everything together. Everything that we have, everything that we are, it's all because of God. He says, in him was life. There's this life we have because maybe sometimes in our days we could think really that other things would be adding life to us. And they may in certain ways, but ultimately, fulfilled life, eternal life, oh, that comes from the man, that comes from the God who made everything and holds all things together. He says, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. A gigantic 30,000 foot look that don't ever forget those of you who are reading this book. Don't ever forget that God is in control. That God made it all. That God makes the wind blow in the seas. God makes the earth. God made you and me and he's this light this life, oh, and then he goes on to say, the true light uh, uh, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This gigantic, powerful, loving God was coming into the world to bring life and light, so he's coming. This God is going to be with us, John says. Oh, but then he says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, because remember, everything is made by God, everything's held together by God. He says, even though he made the world and it was made through him, the world did not, what's that word? They didn't recognize him. Um, It was like he was invisible. They, They didn't recognize him. And then it says, he came that which was his own, you and I, his own, his own sons and daughters. He came as though we would know him. He came as though he had created us. He came as though you're my son, you're my daughter. But his own did not, what's the word? Receive him. So immediately John gives us this gigantic theme 
of saying the world, all-powerful God, comes into the world, the light, the life force of the world, comes here to his own, to us, to you and I. But, uh, but there were some who didn't recognize him. There were some that didn't really get what he was trying to do. Uh, there were some who, who, who didn't receive him. So when I read scripture, uh, what I see is, well, can we miss him today? Can we not recognize what he's trying to do today? Can we not recognize, perhaps invisible, uh, him all around us and him trying to do something? But I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. What is it? And we just go, oh, well, and we miss it. If they missed, according to John, if they missed him then, could we miss him today? Could we not recognize or not receive him today? And that's what I want to talk about for the next few weeks. In what ways do we miss God? In what ways Because John says, understand that he came, the light of the world, the creator of all things. He came to us, his own, his sons and daughters. But but some didn't get it. Some didn't understand why. Some didn't really get it. So they, they missed it. They missed it. What are some of the ways um, that we can miss God in our lives? He becomes uh, virtually uh, invisible. I love what John says here. He says, yet there are some who do receive. He says, uh, yet to all who did receive him, to those who went, oh, this is God. I get it. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. We, we, today, in today's vernacular, we would say uh, they were Christians. They get it. It says, uh, to all who did receive him, to those who believed his name, when you see the word name in Scripture, it means the totality of who that person is. It doesn't, isn't just a name. Name described your lineage. It described who you are. It had a definition. It defined you. Uh, to those who had his name, who understood and believed in his name, he gave the right. And then John draws this picture. There are people that did not receive. There are people that did not get it. And then he says, but those who did get it, Those who did receive, it says they have the right to become children of God, born not of natural descent, just like everything else. You're not common. He says, nor of human decision or in husband's will, because back then uh, men would just have uh, a huge family to have their presence and their family lineage dominate. So it had purpose, what John is saying. For those who got it, who understood That the God of heaven and earth, the God who created all things, the God who came among his own, you and I were his. For those, they were like children, really, really well loved by a father. Those who got it, those who understood it was this thing like, like a God, like a child and a father. He draws this picture. For those, because there were some that didn't, you know. There were some that didn't get it. There were some that didn't. It was kind of invisible. But for those who did, oh, it was like a child. It's like a child being really well loved by a parent. They got it. They understood. How is it that God is invisible to us? It's interesting. We've wrestled with this story before. The layers of this story is so, it's unbelievable. Jesus is traveling, and he comes after days of journey, and he comes to a well. Jacob's well in Scripture tells us, and it says this, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So already the author, by the way, same author, John. Same author. He says it was about noon, so he's already giving us some insight. Man, um, 
something's going on here, because when you draw water from a well, you do it in the morning where the water is cool. So already this is packed, this story is packed with some underlining little deals like, man, why is she at the well by herself in the middle of the day where the water is warm? Everybody else has already gotten what they wanted and they're gone, but she's by herself. Jesus shows up, he's tired from a journey, he sits down by a well, and it says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Uh, what? Yeah, it sounds, seems harmless. So the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Historically, we know the Samaritans and the Jews, they were kind of enemies. They didn't like each other. So already there's this, there's this weird stuff going on. She's coming to the well without everybody else. Jesus is talking to someone he shouldn't culturally speak to. There's all of these layers going on. And says, how can you ask me for a drink? And Jesus answered, here we go. And Jesus answers, if you knew the gift, if you knew who I was, if you know the power that I have, if you know the amount of influence that I have, the things that I'm about to do will blow your mind. <laughs> no. If you knew the gift. That's what Jesus starts the relationship off with. If you knew the gift. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink. So there's a gift and somebody you need to know. It says you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. How is it that you and I can be around God? and him still be invisible. He says, if you know the gift I was about to give you and who was asking you for water, whoo, man, you'd be asking me and you would get this living water. Oh, and then she turns around and she says, and the woman says to her, sir, this is it, give me this water. Yes, you mean to tell me I don't have to come back to this same spot in the middle of the day away from everyone? You mean, I, can, I don't have to do this anymore? Here we go. Start tracking. I don't have to do this anymore to come back to this spot. Oh, man, this living water where I'll never thirst again. Oh, give it to me. Yes. So that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Man, absolutely, what do you got? Whatever you have, give it to me. I know there's a weirdness, Samaritan and Jew, and Adam, nobody's looking, we're by ourselves, just, just give it to me. Ha. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Oh, hey, wait a second, like what happened to the water? Because all I want is a drink of water. Like, you're starting, to clean my, you're starting to clean my clock here. Hold on, you're starting to read my mail. What happened to the water? What, water, me and you, remember, drink, give me a little bit. What about that? Ah, Jesus says, she says, give me this living water. Jesus says, hey, go call your husband. Wah, wah. It's like, what? No, 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 no. My personal life is not here for you to talk about. No, the issues of my life, no, no, we don't bring those. No, no, no. We don't expose stuff that's a little like, eh. No, you're talking about giving me stuff. You're talking about giving me water. That I don't have to come here anymore. We don't. <laughs> Husbands. Uh, you can almost see. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. <laughs> Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have five. Oh, man, this is getting weird. All I wanted was water. And as a matter of fact, I just came at noon so nobody bothered me. <laughs> the fact is, you have five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband's. <laughs> what you have just said is quite true, sir. Uh, the woman said, I can see that you 
are a prophet. What is the deal? I just want the living water. I don't want, I don't want God to get involved in my stuff. I don't want him to get involved in my life. I don't want him to dig down deep inside and get to those things that caused me to go to a well in the middle of the afternoon to be ostracized by community where I go. I don't have to come back to this place, this place of guilt, this place of shame this place of condemnation. I don't want to come back to a place like that, so give me the water. Yes. Jesus says, go call your husband. The guy you're with isn't even your husband. You had five other. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on, because all I want is some water. And she goes, I can see that you're a prophet. And then she does this thing. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. What just happened? It's the equivalent to this. You're having a difficult conversation and something comes up and you're like, uh, excuse me a minute, I'm getting a phone call. Something weird has happened in a relationship with your husband or wife or your kids or your work or your job, whatever it is, and they go, and it's, it's, it's ready. And you're like, oh, this is awkward. This is weird. Oh, hold on, I'm getting a text. <laughs> it's really the equivalent of, hey, how about them bears? <laughs> There's this whole thing, if you knew the gift, if you knew the person wanting to give you this gift, oh, you'd have this living water. Wait, what does she say? Sir, give me this water. But Jesus says, well, wait a second. And then she goes, hey, so anyway, what about the Middle East crisis? Isn't that crazy? Isn't this just nuts what's going on here? It's nuts. The whole husband thing. Uh, uh, the whole five husbands, one husband. Yeah, I know. Hey, so, you, you, you know. Hey, so look at the, the husband. You're not supposed to. You're doing something. You got this. We got to work this out. We got to figure this out. Whew, it's hot in Florida, isn't it? Whew, man. Whew, whew, man. This is crazy. Jesus, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> it's a distractionary tactic. It's a distractionary tactic. You see, the information that she is living with, that you and I all, that you and I live with every day, the things that we're not proud of, the mindsets that are not of God, the behaviors that we do that we're not created for, the things that are in our life that would cause us to go to a well at 12 o'clock in the afternoon away from everyone else so that they wouldn't poke fun, they wouldn't ridicule, and they wouldn't remind us. You mean I don't have to come back to that place? Yeah, yeah, well, give me that water. You see, the information, the five husbands, and the one you're with is not your husband, that information culturally... See, she, that information is pain. That information is hurt. That information is sorrow. That information is shame. That information is guilt. That information is condemnation. What Jesus, why Jesus brings it up is so that he can heal it and free her up, not to condemn her and not to judge her. But because she doesn't recognize, what did John say, the gift and who was asking for the water. She misses it. You and I, Jesus becomes invisible in our life when our pain, when we don't take our pain, our pain causes us to look away. Hey, so what about it? I can't go to that church. I don't like the way he preaches. I can't go over there. I don't like that worship. I was in this church for six months, but ah, you know how those Christians are. Oh, I don't want to. Distractionary tactic. Oh, well, you know how it is. You know how it is with going to church. You know how it is. I just don't, the Bible, I just don't understand it. It's written back in the day. I just don't, distractionary tactic, just like the woman at the well. So our ancestors say that we should worship on this. You Jews said, what? You see, we think many times, you and I, that Jesus is bringing things up in our life to thumb us down to push us down, to make us feel less than. 
to make us feel as though we're not worthy, to make us feel as though we're not qualified to talk to our Creator, to hear from our Creator. You see, the information that Jesus brought up, five husbands, the one you're with, you're not, is not even your husband. She's used to that information being brought up to push away. Jesus brings up the information to free her, to heal her. You and I miss Jesus when we don't allow him access to all the parts of our heart and all the parts of our mind. We, he becomes a, um, invisible because John said those, there were some that did not receive. There were some who did not recognize. But the ones who did understand what it's like to be really, really well loved by a father. See, those who understood what Jesus was about, and I think that's what happens to you and I. I have these things in my life that I don't think God wants to be part of, that I don't believe God is impressed with, and that I don't believe uh, that he would, uh, he would turn. He would not be near me. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. That you've, you've tried five times. How's that working for you? You, you, you've, <laughs> you're trying right now because you, you're with someone and it's not really working. It's interesting, and this won't be on the screens. We know the famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only beloved son. <laughs> Two scriptures after that, it said God did not come in. Same writer, John 3, 17, says God came into the world not to judge and condemn, but to free and make whole. <laughs> see, see, what happens is we become the woman at the well because she missed it. She missed the living water, although she asked for it. <laughs> she asked for it, but then Jesus said, no, I'm going to give it to you, but we gotta, i got to free you up here. There's some stuff going on, and we think, I don't want to. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I talked to a guy. I was having coffee with him, and he goes, man. I said, man, I haven't seen you. He was here in the beginning when we opened the church. I said, man, I haven't seen you. Where you been? He goes, man, I can't come. I go, why? Did you find another place? Or you go to another church in another place? He said, no, I can't come. You have no idea what I have done in the last two years. Look, bro, I don't care what you have done in the last two years. He says, I can't come. You don't understand. I said, look, you don't know half the people at the chapel. They're half whacked anyway. They're doing stuff you wouldn't even believe. <laughs> I didn't really say that. No, I actually kind of said it in certain ways. But anyway, I said, what does that have to do with you coming? Well, because Jesus is going to start making me. He's going to start digging. He's going to start asking, like, why? Why are you living? Like, let's talk about that. Why are you doing that? Well, let's, let's explore. Let's... And he'll never drink from the living water. He'll never have the life that John said he came to give. He'll never know what it's like to be well-loved by a father like a child who John said... Those who receive him understand. I'm not bringing this stuff up. I'm not working you through this. I'm not searching your heart and your mind every time we're in church or every time we read the word of God or every time we go somewhere. We push away from the table because it gets a little too deep. It gets a little too sensitive. It's a little too, it's our five husbands and the one I'm with isn't even your husband. And we miss it. And he becomes invisible because he said, if you knew the gift, the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of mercy, but the gift of wholeness that can only come through a relationship with our creator. And she misses it. And John says, there were some that came, there were some that were here that did not recognize. There were some that did not receive. But those who did earn the right to be a child That's how we miss it. This pain, this stuff that we have, whatever it is, pain in a relationship, guilt, whatever those things are, we don't look to Jesus, we look away. And he come, becomes invisible. There's this uh, picture. Um, 
This is Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. He traveled to Russia to view the painting. He was uh, allowed by authorities to sit and view the painting for nine days straight un uninterrupted and wrote a journal. You can find it in a book called The Prodigal Son. His name is Henry Nowen. And he sat and stared at this painting of the prodigal son, a biblical story where our father, that's a parallel for Jesus, a father to his child. A child says, give me my inheritance, give me what's owed me, give me what I want. He goes away and he squanders everything, squanders his life, makes a mockery of what his father had given him. The story tells us that's a parallel between God our Father and us, and the son comes back. Rembrandt paints this picture. The father in a red cloak, regal and majestic, not grabbing his shoulder saying, what did you do? I told you if you just, I knew that if I gave you this money, what in the world? I told you so. No. His regal and majestic hands over the shoulders of the prodigal son. Leaning down, this mighty man, leaning down and embracing. What I love is how the prodigal son is kneeling, one shoe off, one shoe just tattered, kind of like our lives. There are parts of our lives that are tattered and torn and just beat up from the journey. Henry Nouwen wrote this, here is the God I want to believe in, a father who from the beginning who has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing, never forcing himself on anyone, but always waiting. Never letting his arms drop in despair, but always hoping his children will return. So that he can speak words of love to them and let his tired arms rest on their shoulders. His only desire is to bless. Don't miss God. Don't make him invisible. Don't look the other way with the things that we struggle with. Look to him. Because his only desire, as John says in the beginning, is to give life. And those who did know him understood as a child what it was like to be really, really well loved by a father. Don't change the subject when something's going on during worship in your heart. Don't change the subject in our minds when something is said and it's starting to bring up things. And don't, don't change the subject like the woman at the well. Don't make them invisible. Because I came, if you understood me, John says those who did understand and did receive, if you understood, you would know that I'm a father who all I want to do is bless. It's not to push you out, it's to bring you in. It's not to put you down, but it's to lift you up. It's not to push you away, but to bring you close. Amen. You bow your heads while I pray for you. Lord, this morning, guys, we know, uh, I, want, I want to pray for one person this morning, one type of person, that for the first time, or just it's been a while, that you're realizing, you know what, I ha I've, I've missed him and I didn't receive because I don't, I don't look to Jesus the way I should with my stuff, with my issues, with, with my things. There are some of us that understand and who did receive and do recognize, which is awesome. But there are some, because like the prodigal son, life and the journey, <laughs> our shoes are tattered, one is off our foot. We're coming in, dragging. 
And this morning the Lord is putting his arms as a regal, majestic king embracing you. And that's who I want to pray for this morning. That you begin today to recognize and receive. If that's you where you sit, I, I just it's very simple. You say this prayer of dedicating. I like to call it a prayer of dedication. It's just a, a prayer where you dedicate your life and your mind and your heart to learning what it's like to be a child well loved, really, really loved by a father. If that's you, just repeat something like this after me. Dear God, this morning I receive you. This morning I recognize who you are. My father, my creator, I am your son. I am your daughter. Forgive me for not being who you created me to be. But this morning, I follow you. I follow you more this morning, God, than I did yesterday and the week before. I receive your love. I receive the gift of grace and forgiveness. And this morning, God, I leave as a son and a daughter of you. Amen. This week, Jesus, I ask for a blessing on everyone in this room. Lord, over every family, you watch over us, Lord, protecting us, guiding us, and shaping us. Lord, always giving us the discipline not to look away from you, but to look to you with the things in our life, because you are a father who cares and who loves. Lord, this week, teach us how to see people the way you see us and love people the way you love us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.